We're about to get started here. And Alan's got a copy of the slide so everybody can see what we're doing today. Usually I have to pick who gets to see. Okay, so the Torah portion is Shmini, and we read two key portions out of that. We read instruction of Nadav and Abihu for coming too fast into the holy place when they shouldn't have. That was their father's service. Um, you notice how we got 50-50 here? We've got two brothers that rush in there too fast, and we got two who are standing back kind of waiting to see. It's kind of like, oh, what's the saying? Um, Early bird might get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's always good to have a, a second mouse on hand, just in case the, the running into the battle doesn't work out. Uh, but I, I want to look at this as a matter of being battle kosher. I wanted to connect what happened to Nadav and Avihu with why he would put dietary laws in the very same Torah portion. Because if something doesn't seem to stick, it does. It's, it's just us who aren't stuck yet. So I'm hoping we can stick um, these two things together and um, see how we're going to prepare for the footsteps of Messiah, which I think are very close. You know, if I had to guess in our generation, I don't know about another generation, but I would say for our generation, the fall feasts are going to kick off some pretty serious things. Not that it's not serious already. It's already very serious. Um, and so we're kind of pulling this into the Footsteps of Messiah series uh, that we've been doing out of the Song of Songs. And the verse I wanted to, to continue working with was uh, Song of Songs 217. It says, until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee, turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of Beter. Right, so that one verse has taken us several weeks so far. So I just want to focus on the speeding up. Right? There's a principle all the way through scripture, if you're really paying attention, and you might see it translated different ways. Um, Yeshua talks about uh, unless those days had been, had been shortened, no one would be saved. He said, well, how does he shorten the days? Well, we know he can make a day longer. He can make the sun stand still. But how does he shorten the day? Um, the prophets talk about the day will hurry. Even though it delays, it will hurry. And you're like, make up your mind. Is it going to take longer? Or is it going to take less time? You have to understand time from his point of view. And uh, that's kind of what we've been unpacking. Like, how would he shorten the days for the sake of the elect? This particular verse is just another reminder because he says, until the cool of the day when the shadows flee. I don't know if you've ever stood on the beach facing west when the sun sets, and you'll think that sun is just hung in the sky forever. And as it gets closer down to the water, what happens? Mm -hmm. Boom, it's gone. You're like, well, that was fast. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was the same speed it's been spent. You know, <laughs> the earth's been spinning at the same speed all day. It's our perspective that has changed. So in terms of shortening the days, it could be he simply changes our perspective because it is the end of days. And maybe in a week or two, we can talk about the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled and what that expectation is. At any rate, it tells you it's a time when the day appears to move faster and the beloved is being asked to be like a gazelle or a young stag, always associated with speed, usually in scripture. And especially on mountains, it makes us think of the good news, right? How, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. So the, the good news, the world hears tribulation coming, but we hear footsteps of Messiah on the mountains coming with good news. It's a different perspective. So there's a, a speeding up of the days expected throughout the scriptures for the righteous. How is that going to occur? Well, on the next slide, uh, you can see a graphic that you've seen before 
you've seen multiple overlays of it, like with the feasts. And uh, you might have to hit a button to make it go in motion. Um, it starts out with the rivers of Eden, showing you how Genesis describes their movement. Then with that, um, you get the idea, oh, okay, I'm only seeing half the menorah if I see the traditional menorah. But once I kind of get the whole idea behind the rainbow and how it's picturing for me the upper half of the menorah and the spiritual realm that it's representing, then I get how it worked, especially when I look at the description in Genesis that says <clears throat> these rivers circled. The, the river flowed out of the upper Eden and it watered the whole garden, the whole lower Eden. And so those uh, circuits are terms. The, they're described as savav. The imperative form would be so term. And that's what we just read in the Song of Songs. The beloved is being asked to so over, keep turning, right? Would you agree that our feasts are in a cycle that never stop? Yeah, he's like, hurry. So he's adding, not just go in your cycle, hurry, be like a stagger, young as I want you to circle around faster. Now, can the water flow faster? I don't know. But that's the, that's the request there, go faster, turn faster. And that's going to help us in terms of defining the fall feast. This is such a stumbling block for people, because they get into the semantics. Uh, in the next slide, it's I went ahead and I gave you the Hebrew in addition to the English so that you could see how the fall feasts are treated in the Torah. Sometimes we stumble, well, why do the Jews say Rosh Hashanah? Where's that in the Bible? Well, it's actually in Ezekiel. But um, where are they getting this idea? Well, if we remember that Shana or a year, it doesn't just mean a year, it means a change. There is a transformation process. So especially if we associate with the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah, it's going to be the head of the train of the transformation in us at the resurrection. That's kind of the context. But at least in the Torah, Exodus 34, 22, uh, the Feast of End Gathering or the Feast of Sukkot is called the turn of the year, a, a kufa, to kufa. Again, it's a, it's a synonym, again, to sov, sava, the rivers of Eden, they go round and round. In Exodus 23, 16, it again refers to the Feast of Ingathering Gathering at the end of the year when you gather in the fruit of your labors from the field. In this case, it's betzeit. It's the going out of the year. Like if, if we went out, we would say, um, we went out of the door. Right? So there's the circuit of a year, which is to be considered alongside the beginning of the months. And it's okay if they, if they don't, like, now, wait a minute, how can this be the end or the beginning of a year if the beginning of the months is over here? It's okay. When you set it up on a chart, your one and your seven, the, you just switch them. They're the same thing, actually. So there's something else he wants to teach you in the term of year or transformation, along with a month or a chodesh, a bit, something being new or renewed. And you need both of those ideas to really get it. And this is the, the point I think we'll get to eventually is, I believe at Pesach, Yeshua talks about, we all know when the resurrection is going to occur. We don't know what year, but we know that it's, it's supposed to correspond to the Feast of Trumpets. But there's going to be enough evidence, I think, about shortening the days and some actual textual clues that we can say, no, wait a minute. What if something very significant happens at Pesach? that to our perception maybe would shorten the days, that somehow would it be possible to enter into this realm at Pesach and find ourselves at Sukkot? In other words, with this one you're used to, okay? If we just look at this outer river of Eden, the Pishon River, and then we look at it in, in the context of the seven spirits, he says this seven spirit the spirit of reverence is the beginning of all wisdom which is the first so they're actually a never-ending river 
Passover and Sukkot are a never ending river. They're connected to one another thematically and we're told to keep Sukkot in remembrance of when you came out of Egypt. These can't be random texts. He doesn't do random things. He puts what he wants in the text on purpose, so we'll pay attention to it. And it's usually so simple, we miss it. If in our minds, he wants us to connect these two things, then Yeshua is saying, well, I'm going to come in an hour that you think not. It might be that our readiness needs to be for each feast. Because you might find yourself in the fall feasts from Passover somehow. How does that work? Ask Yeshua. He went in and out at will, but I've never been able to do that. Um, at any rate, that change is what we're looking at because it has to do again with the turning of the feasts. So we've got the fall feasts that are marking the turn, a new circle of the year or the change. And we've got the cool of the day. That's what we read in the Song of Songs until the cool of the day. We want when these shadows flee. Well, cool of Hayom, the day, is Puach in that verse. It's a sound alike to Ruach. Remember, he came in the cool of the evening in the Ruach of Hayom in Genesis, and Adam and Eve were hiding in the trees when he came in the cool of the evening or the Ruach of the evening. They heard his voice walking, and we know his voice, it can sound to us like a shofar, like it was at Sinai, and it scared them. You know, if you've been breaking commandments, the sound of the shofar should scare you. You should feel naked and ashamed if you know you've been breaking commandments. So we've got two sound alike words. The difference between ruach and puach, and puach is what's being associated here with the footsteps of Messiah when he comes. Puach has to do with the hastening of time. All right, here's this another clue means to hurry up, and it has to do with the fanning or the blowing of flames, which is associated with the wrath of the Lamb. The, the flames will be fanned at that time. So you can see that if you put it back in the Hebrew, it does have apocalyptic implications to it. And then it says, be like a gazelle. In the next slide, I took a picture of this in South Africa. I thought he just had some awesome shofars on his head. Um, but he's speedy. And this is where you get the big shofars. You can get the little ones off a ramp and they've got a nice sound to them. But if you want that, that nice, deep, booming sound, you get one from one of these, uh, you might call them an antelope gazelle. I guess it depends on, you know, science what genus or species or whatever it's called. But this is where you're going to get the shofar. So if you hear a shofar, it could also be that you're hearing a speeding up of the day, maybe in your perception. But it's seen as the sound, these gazelles on the mountains, because they've got shofars. They're heralding the return of Messiah. So they see these shofars on these antelope or these gazelles as the signal of the end of the exile. And if you're not in Jerusalem, I'm sorry to tell you, you're in exile. This is not your home. If that's your identity, if, if this covenant is your identity, then wherever you are is an exile. So we've got the sighing of the exile, which is symbolized by the shadows, they're going to flee and hide. So whatever oppression you have been enduring in your exile, he says at the sound of this shofar, you're going to emerge. You're going to come out of those trees, right? And you're going to be greeting him with shouts of joy, not with shame. Right? And when we hear the sound of the shofar, one of the primary things about it, it it's a multi-purpose instrument. But one of the things it's supposed to do is shatter your heart into repentance. And that's why we, we break down those shofar calls. So you can hear like, okay, he's getting ready to move. He's moving from the judgment seat to the mercy seat. I want to take advantage of this window right here and be prepared to be judged from the seat of mercy 
rather than the judgment seat. And the mercy seat was located in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting. You want to be gathered into the tent in the day of trouble is the subtext there. You, you don't want to be somewhere around an upside down Midianite Amalekite tent. <laughs> uh, wrong tent to, to be trying to get under in a, day of, in a day of battle. That's not the tent. In a day of battle, you want to be able to say for the Lord and for Gideon, we're going to battle with these 300 shofars. And so if you are to know the sound of the shofar, it means you are to experience it. It's sacrificial. You had to pay something for it. You're probably not going to know it. You might hear it with your physical ear. And like we said, unless you want to think it's just a car whose car alarm went off outside, you'll hear the sound, but you won't know it if you're not prepared through repentance. And so Jeremiah 6, 17 says, I've set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. So a lot of people, they're hearing these shofars. The, the Moedim are being proclaimed to them. The Shabbat is being proclaimed to them. And they said, we will not listen. No, we won't. Some people just haven't been asked yet. That's our job. We're here to invite them to know the sound of the shofar. But some people, even once they understand it, they're gonna say, we're not gonna to listen to that because then we'd have to give up our Easter eggs and our bunny rabbits, our chocolate bunnies and, and our Christmas trees. And Well, you wouldn't give that up for the one who created you. You wouldn't give up the created for the one who created. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it begins with Israel. We have to know the sound of the shofar. In the seventh month, and you're going to know the sound of the shofar at Pesach. If you're in here, probably, you're going to know that sound. But whether the world wants to hear it or not, even like Jeremiah said, even whether Israel wants to hear it or not, there were Israelites who didn't want to hear it. They said, we will not listen. We'll chase after the Baals. We'll just put them all together, right? We'll worship Jesus and, and this other stuff at the same time. We'll just follow after our own stubborn will. So the whole world is going to pass under the shepherd staff for reckoning at the Feast of Trumpets. Our goal is we want to be already written, inscribed, and sealed on that day. That day is seen more for the lukewarm, the people who couldn't decide who they wanted to be. Because the idea is you were sealed over. Remember, he says, I will set you as a seal on my arm. He says, I'm going to seal you over at Pesach. I'm going to seal you over at Shavuot. So by the time you arrive at the fall feast, you know the sound of the shofar. Because in that sealing, what is he doing? He's going to be testing you. It's not going to be all fun and games. You're going to be tested according to that word. And the more you suffer for that word and your obedience to that word, then the more likely you are to know that sound, to know it, not to hear it, but the natural ear and actually know it because I've known him in the fellowship of his suffering. Would you say that Yeshua suffered for Pesach to be obedient? So really, what, <laughs> what are we going to do that can compete with that? Nothing. Did he suffer for Shavuot? Did he suffer for obedience to the commandments? Yeah. Did he suffer to be the one standing there as if slain to open the seals? All that was suffering, guys. But through our suffering, we prepare. It's going to cost you something. It says, blessed are the people in Psalm 89, 15. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. Lord, they walk in the light of your face. Remember what we learned about the ironic benediction? May lift up his face upon you. Well, that lifting up of the light of the Holy One's face is considered to be the resurrection. So when you say the ironic benediction, it's praying the resurrection over people. So if you know the joyful sound of the shofar, then you should be able to experience his lifting up his countenance upon you at the resurrection, right? You'll be lifted up with a shout. 
with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Now, for the rest of the world, will they know that? I don't know what they'll know. But you want your head lifted up, not like the baker, right? Not like the baker. He got his head lifted up in a different way. Wicked Haman, may his name be blotted out. They got their heads lifted up in a different way. Well, what do those two have in common? You remember? They're both suspected of trying to assassinate the king. The cupbearer, the one who quickly squeezed the grapes into the cup so that no poison could be added, he goes free. But the baker who delays, he's got these three baskets of bread on his head. Well, the basket is specifically associated with Sukkot. Also, not just the grapes and the wine, but the baskets. You set your basket down before the priest. You say, you know, behold, I brought the first fruits of the ground. You know, behold, my, uh, what did say? Uh, my father was a wandering Aramean. But here's the basket. It says that you have been quick to bring his food back to him. So if you have been quick to bring his food back to him, you have probably suffered something for that. If you are quick to obey his word, you will suffer for that. This is something that is skipped over in salvation invitations. And, and if it's sold as a bright and shining life afterwards, and you're not told about discipleship and the temptations and, and how that adversary goes after the weak ones, then you're not preparing them for the battles that will follow. And that's not fair. It needs to be balanced. Yes, you need salvation. But you know what? He's going to pick you up and teach you how to walk. Right? He's going to disciple you. The, the essence of that is discipline. Discipline and disciple, same root word. So you can't be a disciple without discipline. Right? Um, so if you hear or you know the sound of the teruah, which again is when it is thought that he moves from the judgment seat over to the mercy seat. At that moment, it says he descends with a shout when it talks about, uh, when Paul writes to the Thessalonians, but in the psalm, it says he ascends with a shout. It's because of the transition between the two thrones. We want to be part of that transition where he ascends with the shout, and then we go up with him because he's about to sit down on the mercy seat, even though that's still scary to me. Uh, as long as you're on Yeshua's chest, that's why he had those, the high priest had the stones on his chest. He also had the 12 tribes on his shoulders. How can you stand before even the mercy seat? Yeshua is going to make you stand. Just like you put your kids on your shoulders, or you hold them in your arms when you know they can't walk on their own. That's what Yeshua was doing with the breastplate and the shoulder pieces. But really, if you know, if you know the sound of the Teruah, because you've known Yeshua and the fellowship of his suffering, then you will know it again. You will know because you've experienced spiritual battles before. If you've never had a spiritual battle before that point, I don't know that you will know the sound of the shofar because the shofar signals the battle. The battle has begun. So it's, it's part of our training. It's a, it's a comforting thing. Like his rod and his staff, they comfort me, right? Even when it's uncomfortable, right? Sometimes he has to make us guilty in order to bring us to repentance. So we need that shofar to shatter us into repentance. If the shofar is not shattering us into repentance, then we probably won't know it. We'll just hear it. It brings about a change in you. It brings about repentance year by year. Through the feast, you blow the shofar over the feast, right? Your new moons. There are specific times. And so it's a daily walk of repentance. You don't just repent one time and then everything you do after that is golden. You're going to do some stinky stuff. I do some stinky stuff. <laughs> but you know what? I have to keep repenting or I haven't known the sound of the shofar. It has not shattered me into repentance. 
So it's signaling repent because when you are changed, spirit, soul, and body on that day at the sound of the teruah, how do you want to go up? How much of you do you want there to be left? Because the, the stinky stuff doesn't go with you. I don't know if we'll go in without arms and legs like Yeshua said. <laughs> it's like, what happened here? <laughs> well, I just didn't think the walk was worth the suffering, you know? And that's what Yeshua says in Matthew 7. He says, many will say to me on that day. What day? On that day. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Believe me, you who practice lawlessness. He says, you have to not just hear these words of mine, you have to act on them. That's the difference. If you act on them, then you will know the sound of the teruah and he will know you. And then in 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 12, it, it talks about this. He says, therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Uh, yeah. Or of me, his prisoner. Remember, for the Lord and for Gideon. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord of me or to me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day, that day. So you see here, you, your works are not the origin of goodness. You never created goodness. You can make it in this world in places that never existed before, but you can only do it in the righteousness of Yeshua. Any other righteousness will be rewarded in this world and then there will be nothing in the world to come. But for the righteous, you will suffer in this world for the gospel. And you just have to trust when you look around and you say, wait a minute, why doesn't he treat me any differently than the world? I'm, I'm suffering in some ways worse than the world. Why can't, you know, it, he made a distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians at some point. Is he ever going to make a distinction between us? Is he ever going to heal us? When? And he says, just hang with me. You're going to suffer for the sake of the gospel, and it's for your perfection. Don't be distracted. You have to believe that what you've committed to him through your obedience he is able to protect that until that day. And then in hindsight, it's, it's all going to make, make sense. Like, that's my favorite hymn, farther along. <laughs> well, I'll understand it. Farther along, we'll understand why. But cheer up, my brothers. Walk in the sunshine. Uh, and that's what Paul says. He says, I know who I believed. Do you know who you believe? Not just know. Everybody knows. But do you know him? Do you know him in the fellowship of his suffering, like Paul is saying? And you're willing to walk that until that day, no matter how bad it gets. And it will get bad. Do you believe that he will hold those things and protect them? He will protect your faith. Because that I know in Greek, Edo, is the cognate to yada which is knowing, yodea, the spirit of knowledge. And so we too have to know Yeshua and the fellowship of that suffering. So again, the question, how does he shorten the days? Exodus 12, 26, if you want to go to that slide, it says, for arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home, for there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, rise up. 
What does rise up imply in scripture? Resurrect. Get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go and bless me also. So do you see this little hint? Yeah, we're looking for the resurrection at the Feast of Trumpets, but can there be a preliminary rising at Pesach? Why else would he have them have their sandals on their feet, their belts on, and their staff in their hand while they eat the Passover? Be ready. You need to be ready to rise up. Where will you go? Very likely into the cloud. Which means there's a degree of protection there as long as you're not a complainer and a grumbler and a tester. He says, I brought you out to test you and you're testing me. You, you got the test all backward here. So that's something we can look for. Um, again, you blow the shofars over each of the feasts. Now we've got symbols at least in the story of Gideon or Gidon in Hebrew. How does he know he's gonna be victorious? He's eavesdropping. <laughs> and we don't know if he just literally heard that because he was also told, rise up, soldier, get up. I want you to go hear something. So did he sneak up there and literally hear them talking? Or was he simply able to rise up like Yeshua did sometimes and be somewhere but not be seen? He and his servant or his friend or whatever he was. But he overhears this enemy's dream of a round loaf of barley. Yeah, does that make you think of the circuits of the feasts? Tumbling into the camp of Midian, knocking that camp upside down. This is occurring at the time of Pesach, the time of the first fruits of the barley. So Gidon knows, yeah, this, this is a good sign right here. I needed to hear this. But one thing about the barley to remember Israel had fallen into Baal worship. That's how Gidon got the name Yerubaal, because he had to deal with the Baals before he went into battle. What do we have to do before we go into battle if we expect to be successful? We got to find the Baals and deal with them, no matter what daddy says. <laughs> I thought that was funny as daddy gave him the name. <laughs> you know, if Baal wants it fixed, Baal's going to have to go deal with him himself because I'm, I'm not going to discipline over him. Uh, but you brought the barley meal offering in if you were suspected of adultery. This is what Israel's been doing, committing spiritual adultery. He says, okay, I'm going to give you the sign, but I want you to understand what you see. When you see this round loaf of barley, I suspect you of adultery. And this is why Gidon had to uproot that before he could go into battle. Basically, it's Israel on trial. Gidon, we know, is going to pass this test, but there are going to be Israelites. See, we, we've got the army out here. He's dealing with that. But then Gidon is going to come back. He's going to deal with the enemy within. They have the same citizenship. They might go to feasts. They might observe Shabbat. They might eat kosher. Um, but war in Hebrew is milchama. Milchama. Do you hear lechem, which is bread? It's always been about the food, guys. The war from the beginning has been about food, right? Eat this, don't eat that. And so in the Torah portion, we're told, <laughs> don't end up like Nadav and Avihu. I want you to learn a lesson from kosher eating. Because we had two sons who rush in. And we have two sons who watch <laughs> them rush in. <laughs> and then they have to you know, continue to minister. That would have been the hard part. Um, so we're either going to eat the daily bread of heaven and obey it, or we're going to suffer with the enemy. It doesn't matter what your citizenship is. I don't care how saved you are. If, if you practice like the enemy, then he'll eventually discipline you like an enemy. That's the pattern we have here in the story of Gideon, All right? So he confronts, as, as the men are putting Midian and the Amalekites to the sword, they grow weary. 
they've just killed so many people. I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever fought for just two minutes, you feel like you can't even move your arms and legs anymore. If you go all out, don't ask me how I know that, but <laughs> you're, and you get to a point eventually, if you just keep fighting, like when we would do a, a Krav Maga test, they just keep throwing bodies at you. They're trying to find the, the point where you know there's one punch left and will you quit and back out and say, I don't need this to live the rest of my life? Or will you stand up there and throw it and know you're going down once you throw it? This is the point they're at. They're just exhausted. And so Gidon goes to the elders. There's 77 elders. Is that a random number? There's 77 elders of Sukkot. There's Sukkot again. And Penuel, which is the face of God. And they have a tower. And so the elders of Penuel say, hey, wait a minute, we got this tower. We'll be protected from the Midianites. The men of Sukkot, they think they have everything. Isn't Sukkot everything? It's a, you bring in everything at Sukkot. It's the end of the, the year and the going out of the year. So they're feeling pretty smug. Whatever's going on, they see they don't even realize the slavery that they're in. And that happens to us sometimes. We get so used to harsh conditions that the enemy just gradually imposes, imposing, okay, I'll put up with that. Okay, I'll put up with that. Okay, I'll put up with that. But, you know, if you don't take this thing away from me, I still feel pretty good. And where's the tipping point? You see, by the time you're, you're willing to fight, you may have already lost everything. And then you're afraid to fight. And this is the men of Sukkot and Penuel. They're like, why do we need to fight? Because we will lose everything. It might be bad, but it could be worse. And they say to Gideon, are they in your, the palm of your hand already that you want us to help you? And all he's asking, he's not saying, give me a sword. He said, I'm not even asking for me. I'm just asking for these 300. Give them some bread and some water, please, so we can wipe out the rest of the enemy so this won't come back. How many times have we waged wars and didn't finish? Because people got weary. And then there wasn't enough support. There, the, the bread and the water of support was not there to finish the job. We got battle weary, leg weary, blood weary. And what is it? It just reforms itself. It just incubates and it hatches again. Gideon's trying to make sure it doesn't hatch again even though it will. And so the, the men, they just like the elders, they refuse. No, we're not going to help you. You know, um, and that's unfortunate because Gidon says, okay, we'll keep going, but you know what? We'll be back. And we're going to deal with you when we come back because you thought you could be apathetic and wait and see who won. You ever talk to anybody that said, well, yeah, we probably will do those feasts in the kingdom. Well, why wouldn't we do them now? You going to wait and see who wins? Yeah, well, maybe we will keep Shabbat in the kingdom. Well, how long are you going to stand there and wait? Are you going to fight for it? Are you going to stand there and see if Yeshua actually wins? Does that sound stupid? But see, in their brain, it doesn't, or they wouldn't say it. They don't see it as a battle. We understand it's a battle. We know the sound of the shofar. We know the suffering it's going to bring in our lives if we keep the Shabbat and we keep the peace. It's going to make trouble at work. It's going to make trouble with our family. It's going to make trouble with our friends. It's going to make trouble with Little League. It's going to make trouble with Pee Wee League. It's going to make trouble with everything. But you know you're in a battle, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know they are because they're standing back saying, well, when Yeshua comes, if he tells me he's serious about that, I mean, I know it's in the word. Yeah, I see that. I see that. You showed me that. Yeah, okay, I got it. But let Yeshua come back and tell me. I'm like, oh, he'll come all right. <laughs> oh, Yeshua going to come all right. But you don't want to see that part of Yeshua. He's going to be just like Gidon. What were you waiting for? You couldn't sustain my people. They're out there doing the battle. He didn't even ask them to go to battle. He said, just help us do what we're doing. He said, no. 
We won't help you. Do you know what? It's going to be worth it. These are the people, Hosea 10, 8, it talks about these uh, thorns and thistles. It talks about the high places of Aven, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorns and thistles will grow on their altars, and they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. You read it again in Luke 23, 30. They will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. In Revelation 6, 16, you read it. They said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who's sitting on the throne? <clears throat> Sure, the Father has given all things into his hand. So do you want to be judged from the judgment seat or the mercy seat? Those being judged from the mercy seat, he lifts them up. He says, rise up, gather up. You know the sound of the shofar. You will ever be in the presence of Adonai. And then there's 10 days to give those intermediates a last chance. Repent. Don't wait till the war's over to jump in, nothing happens. It's gonna be a little silent. You're gonna hear crickets chirping up until Sukkot. And then when Sukkot starts, that's when Gideon comes back with thorns and briars and he disciplines the men of Sukkot. They might've been citizens of the kingdom, but they weren't helping. Right. Let's skip ahead a little bit here. Um, in fact, when Gidon called the tribes, when he, he was of the tribe of Menashe, he calls Asher also, Zebulun and Naphtali. He called them with the shofar, with the yitka, when you hear the tekiya in there, it's like, okay, wake up, it's time, it's time, muster up. But eventually, again, he boils it down to 300 warriors. So you, you've got those who just shoved their faces into the water, completely left their flanks exposed, right? They were impatient, they were thirsty. Well, what differentiated the 300? They didn't leave their flanks exposed, they were vigilant in a day of battle and they brought the water up to their mouths, an extra degree of patience because see, they were gonna be hungry and thirsty. Even though they were winning by a mile, they were still going to be hungry and thirsty. So here's the test. Can you discipline yourself with being hungry and being thirsty? Right? It's the same test in the wilderness. He said, I let you be hungry and thirsty to see what was in your heart to humble you. We have to be okay with that. And so Judges 7, 18, Gidon says, when I and all who are with me blow the shofar, then you also blow the shofars around Savivot. See the circle again? Savivot, the entire camp, and say for the Lord and for Gideon. Which goes back to, again, the day of battle. Is it just for the Lord? Or is it for the body of Messiah as well? Are we a group? Are we an army? Um, and this is how he's separating the lukewarm from those who are all in. How is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Well, remember the men of Sukkot, these are the ones he has to come back and discipline with thorns and briars. Revelation 3.14 is written to the congregation of Laodicea, which corresponds to Sukkot. It's the seventh one. He says, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything. And you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Refined by fire. Remember fanning the flames, the puach of Hayom, the, the cool of the day. 
so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. It takes us back to that meal in the garden. They knew they were naked. And the eye salve to apply to your eyes so that you may see. Eye in Hebrew is ayin. Ayin has a value of 70. And there were 77 elders of Sukkot. That would spell in Hebrew, ayin, zayin, az. Az is a goat. He separates the sheep from the goats. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The men of Sukkot needed to repent. The men of Penuel needed to repent. They thought their strong tower would save them. And so many times we talk about, you know, he's my strong tower of salvation. Yeah, you have a strong tower of salvation, but in a day of battle, you better get out of it and go to war. You better figure out what you can do to help. You have to participate. And so we've got uh, Nadav and Avihu. At first glance, it just looks like they're all in, right? These are the warriors. They rush in there, and what happens? Bam! Crispy critters. But remember the, the guys who got down and stuck their faces in the water? They didn't consider everything. We have to be able to drink and eat vigilantly. We have to restrain ourselves. So in the very same Torah portion, he gives us the dietary laws. And that's why it's not a random distribution. He's saying, don't be like Nadav and Avihu. Don't just stick anything in your mouth. Think about it. Watch your flanks. Be patient. We have to be swift to obey but you're going to have to protect yourself with truth. And how many of you have seen people come into this walk all aflame and then they just flame out? They didn't consider, right? That before you run in there 100 miles an hour, because often what we're trying to do is we don't study, so we don't learn how to do things properly. And then all of a sudden we go, you know, fall into confusion because it feels like, well, this is, I don't understand all this. Sure you do. You understood back here that there are different offices and gifts within the body, and there are people there to guide you to keep you from getting off track. Just like Gidon, you have to recognize it's for the Lord and for Gidon. You're part of a family now. They can show you how to suit up for battle. So you have to balance patience with the warrior's willingness. Uh, so why? Why the thorns? He says uh, in Judges 8, 16, he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and he disciplined the men of Sukkot with them. Uh, and in Hebrew, it doesn't say discipline. In Hebrew, it says yada. It says he knew them. He says, oh, okay. You don't want to know the one you serve in the fellowship of suffering with us, with the Lord in Gidon? then okay, I'll come back and I'll know you, but I'll know you with thorns and briars. You will be disciplined. If you refuse this discipline, then he will come back and discipline you and it won't be fun. It's, not, it's never fun to be disciplined, but it's better to be disciplined so that you know the sound of the shofar so that when Messiah Yeshua returns, that he doesn't have an ax to grind. Like, not only did you not enter the battle, you didn't even help the ones who were. I'm going to know you, all right. You don't know me in the fellowship of my suffering. There's another resurrection. Maybe you might get on the waiting list for the next resurrection, right? There's another one coming, but it doesn't sound like, <laughs> it doesn't sound like you're ready for the first one. You need a little more time with the thorns and the briars. So to discipline somebody is also to know him. Okay. Um, Hebrews 5, 5 through 10, you're familiar with that. It says, although he was a son, Yeshua learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. 
being designated by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. So Yeshua didn't have to learn what obedience was. He already knew. But until he suffered for what he learned, right, he didn't experience the discipline. You don't just get to learn the Torah. You get to learn the Torah with suffering. So cheer up, <laughs> right? If Yeshua had to be perfected to be that perfect sac sacrifice, only being perfect, standing as if slain, he suffered something for what he believed. If you're not willing to suffer for what you believe, you probably don't know Yeshua in that same way. You might know who he is, but he may not know you. Because if he knows you, he knows you have suffered with him, that you stood for something. And so Gideon, he goes back and he disciplines them with thorns. All right, I want to read you a little something that explains this. Why the kosher loss? And it focuses on the fish. I got this out of Ulpanor's newsletter uh, yesterday. This is back to our Torah portion. The Torah identifies permissible and forbidden for consumption animal species. Uh, fish must have fins and scales. And it says this, you may eat of all that's in the waters, everything that has fins and scales, you may eat. Anything that has no fins and scales, you may not eat. So for a fish to be kosher, it needs both fins and scales. So their question is, why are fins and scales the characteristics that distinguish kosher fish? Well, they say there's a fascinating statement about it in the Talmud. It says all fish that have scales are also inevitably going to have fins, meaning they're going to be kosher. If you can find a fish with scales, it's kosher. But there are fish that have fins but do not have scales, not kosher. So it says, if a fish which has scales inevitably has fins, why the need for both sides? It could have only written scales, but it also writes fins. And it says, so that the Torah should be increased and made great. They say, that's a strange answer. The sages explain that the food a person consumes has a profound effect on his or her psyche. And they teach us that the physical attributes of all animals reflect their psychological and soul qualities. Therefore, when a person eats the flesh of a particular creature, the inner personality of that creature affects the person. Scales shield and protect the body of the fish. They represent the quality of integrity, which protects people from falling prey to the many pitfalls that life presents. Remember the men who brought the water up to their mouths with their hands? They were shielding and protecting one another. They're not just watching their own backs, they're watching the backs of every other person. And so this integrity, they say, is represented by the scales. Fins, on the other hand, are the engine that propel the fish forward. They represent the drive for achievement. They drive us to fulfill our dreams. So you can be like Nadav and Avihu. You can have fins, drove them right in there. <laughs> but they didn't have the scales. Why? Because the integrity there, the integrity would have said, wait a minute, this service was given to our father, Aharon, and he hasn't even had a chance to go give the incense offering yet. We run in there, we get caught up in ecstasy. Well, that's not, that's not using your scales. That might be something we can say. Are you using your scales on that? Are you using your fins? But it says fins and scales embody two qualities in the souls of these types of fish that are necessary for the correct and healthy development of human character. When a person consumes the substance of such a fish, he becomes a better and more refined and balanced human being. Uh, in other words, you thought about it. You didn't just stick it in your mouth. You went through a process. You consider, is this a kosher fish? 
is this action I'm about to take kosher? Is it permitted by the word or is it not permitted by the word? Because I don't want my fins just driving me in there. But see, I don't know the word. I only know about the word. See, they studied, they just didn't study hard enough. Because had they studied hard enough, they would know they were not permitted to go in there yet. One day they would be, not that day. So I hope that kind of squares that away a little bit. I'll leave that up here if you want to come see the full article later. Um, but that's the idea, is we need to know the sound of the shofar because we have considered every step that we took. Um, Psalm 47 is about the resurrection. It says, God has ascended with a shout. Remember, he goes down from the mercy, the judgment seat goes up to the mercy seat. The Lord, with the sound of a shofar, bring praises, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm of wisdom. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. See how the kingship and the throne are emphasized at the Feast of Trumpets. Now do you see why? Because it's not really in the Torah. You have to go to the Psalms and some of the writings to figure out, well, why did the rabbis put all this stuff about? It's not even about repentance. Have you noticed? If you look at the Moksor, it's about kingship and the throne. It's not about even repentance yet, even though you should. And the idea is, if you can't acknowledge him as the king sitting on the throne, then you will not behave that way. You can say all day, I believe that Elohim is a king sitting on the throne. But if your behavior says something else, I really don't. I don't think he's watching. I don't really think he's on the throne because I don't really think I'll be judged for this behavior. So I'll go ahead and do it. If you really believed he was on the throne, you'd quit doing that. If you really believed he was on the throne, you would start doing that. You would know what his word said, and you would behave as though he were the king on the throne. If he's not the king on the throne, then quit playing. Yeshua says, get cold. Don't be lukewarm. Don't say he's the king on the throne if he isn't the king on the throne. What you're doing has to line up. How are you going to sing praises to God? And you know you've been your own king or queen on your own throne your whole life. It says God reigns over the nations. It says, the princes of the people have assembled as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He's highly exalted. Princes of the people, the people of the God of Abraham. That's everybody. Everybody walks under the shepherd's staff on Rosh Hashanah. And you can do it crying and complaining about don't say Rosh Hashanah, or you can do it humbly and say, I, I, okay, I see where you're coming from. I'm not going to judge that. I'm going to act as though he's the king on the throne and he's judging every word that comes out of my mouth. It's for him and it's for his people. We are a people. With trumpets, with the sound of the shofar, shout joyfully before the king, the Lord. May the sea roar and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. May the rivers clap their hands. May the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord. These are all nations, references to the nations, by the way. He's coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with fairness. Judgment is coming. And he will either come and lift up your heads, right? He will restore you like the cupbearer was restored. He will lift up your head one way, or he'll lift up your head like the bakers and Hamans. May his name be blotted out. Mm. <laughs> So again, we want to be brought into the Ohel Moed, which is the tent of meeting. This is why we're keeping the feasts. This is why we're keeping the Shabbat. We're knowing the sound of the shofar in spite of the suffering that we know goes with it. And actually, we've not suffered what the apostles suffered. No, we've not even come close. Right? But we can proceed knowing that the enemy's tent will be knocked upside down or we are safe in the tent. Psalm 27, we'll close with this. 
and then we want to we'll need to log out for people on the live stream we'll need to log out um and Bezrat Hashem, I'll see you next Shabbat. But we've got some things to do as a congregation, I think, today. It says on the day of trouble, literally says the day of evil. On the day of evil, he will conceal me in his tent, his tabernacle. He will hide me. He will secret me in the secret place of his tent. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. Where are your enemies? They're still down there because they didn't know the sound. And I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And this is why we want to know the sound of the shofar. This is why we want to, you know, know the sound of the shofar on a day of battle and know that we have already fought the fight. Did we win every day? No, but you did. You did. Even if you failed on a particular day, it taught you. That discipline, remember, discipline comes with thorns and briars. That light discipline of that day, I really messed up here. You repented. You let the shofar shatter. You enter repentance and you pick yourself up the next day and you try it again. And if you got knocked down, you picked yourself up. Why? Because it was continually changing and transforming you. Sometimes it happened fast. Sometimes it happened slow. It might still be happening right now. Some things take a little longer. Don't despair. Because you're still knowing the sound. If the word is bringing you to repentance, you know the sound. He's preparing you. And uh, those are the people he wants to lift up and to be in his presence forever. Because we'll have something in common at that point. Right? I'm going to say goodbye to our live streamers. And we'll see you next week. Shabbat Shalom. Okay, we're off. <laughs> or we should be. Okay, Jimmy.